Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started here. And uh, we're going to continue on with um, the cells. The lab test opened up today uh, for lab test one, and it will stay open until Friday. And lecture test one opens up Friday and stays, or Saturday, and open and stays open to the following Saturday. So you have, um, you won't have, you know, test, test, lecture test one opens up right after lab test one closes, but you'll have a week to get ready and take it before next uh, Saturday. Lab this afternoon, we'll meet and well, online, and we're going to talk about the axial uh, and appendicular skeletons. And so that'll get you back, get the uh, Monday lab back on track with the Tuesday lab. Not that it really matters all that much, but it's, uh, it will, it will, um, you'll be tracking together then. So anyway, any questions on anything? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, start us and go into the exciting world of uh, diffusion. I bet you can't wait. So uh, anyway, okay, so. So just to review, you know, we know that the cell membranes are gonna be um, uh, controlling what goes into and out of a cell. And it's very, very selective. And the cell membranes don't want to let anything come in. They don't want to let anything go out. Now, normally, diffusion occurs all the time. Diffusion is it's simply the movement of something of a molecule from a high concentration to a low concentration down the concentration gradient from high to low. Uh, and if a substance is fat soluble, it can diffuse easily into a cell. If it's microscopic, like uh, oxygen molecules or carbon dioxide molecules, it can diffuse into and out of the cell. Water, not so much. Water can't get through because of the cell membrane. Uh, but simple diffusion is simply movement of, of a substance from a high concentration to a low concentration. Forget membranes, forget anything else, whether it's in air or water or in a gel, the movement will always be from the high concentration to a low concentration. And it's totally passive. There's no energy required to make it happen. The movement of the air molecules surrounding the substance that's floating in the air will push them, push the substance around. The substance, you know, an odor doesn't need any energy on its own to spread. It will be pushed by the air molecules around it a substance in water will be pushed around. Like we see it in this example with the dye pellet being dropped into the beaker of water. It doesn't need anything except the random motion of the water molecules, which is already occurring. So we see very simply, diffusion is the freest of the free rides here now. Plasma membranes can interfere with diffusion, though. Plasma membranes are the phospholipid bilayer, which are, you know, they're made up, uh, they look uh, like this. They have the, they work for me. Here we go. Now, the phospholipid bilayer has the phosphate heads like this and the tails. And it has the inner layer that looks like this with the tails. And this is a phospholipid. I saw the right or not. That means that stuff that's fat soluble slides through. Fats go through. Water bounces off. Water can't get in through simple diffusion. 
water has to have a channel. Water has to have a channel to go through. So um, it doesn't, here we go. Let me clear all this. Now, why didn't that work? Okay. There we go. Okay. So what gets through the cell membrane? Well, water doesn't get through unless it has help. If you're if you are fat soluble, like a steroid, like cholesterol, you can slide through. If you are very tiny, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, you can pass through. Or you can have help. You can have a carrier molecule, like a, a channel that will let water come through. That's the only way you can get in. Because um, the, the plasma membrane keeps everything else out. Problems with the plasma membrane, you've got a burn patient, for example. A, a burn patient that's burned down to, uh, you know, let's say it's a third degree burn. Third degree burns are usually burnt to the bone. You know, to be very graphic, it looks a lot like barbecued ribs you know, with the meat falling off the ribs, you know, because the bones are exposed. Um, the, uh, that's what uh, third degree burns look like. The tissue, the muscle tissue has been burned away and all the cells around that burn are ruptured and they're leaking fluid. And so your patient with third degree burns over a large portion of their body are at great risk for becoming rapidly dehydrated because they're oozing uh, plasma everywhere. Uh, they're losing salts, they're losing uh, electrolytes, they're losing all sorts of amino acids, they're losing proteins, and they're losing a lot of fluid. And it's usually going in as fast, you know, it's, it's going out as fast as you're trying to put it in, into them, replace what they're losing. Not only that, but that creates a, a warm, moist environment for bacteria to grow. So not only is your patient losing fluids drastically, they are prime for some sort of uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria to take advantage of that because the skin, the barrier to protect them isn't there. So tremendous amount of fluid loss uh, after that kind of burn. So, so another way to get substances across the membrane is through what we call facilitated diffusion. We know that water has to have help. Water has to have a channel, uh, a channel protein to get, get it through. I mean, that's what we're looking at. Um, right here, this is a channel protein. A channel protein is nothing more than a tube that allows water to come through. If this is water, water goes through it like that. It's simply a channel, but it's help. It's a way to get water into the cell. It's, they're called aquaporins. You know, it's a, a water tube, if you will. Uh, other types of proteins embedded in the membrane are carrier proteins. And carrier proteins are specialized proteins that will allow substances to come through um, there we go. A carrier protein is a substance that will change its shape to allow some, uh, as, uh, some other material to come through. Like in the bottom screen in the left hand side there, you see that purple structure. That's a carrier protein. Carrier protein usually has a specific shape on on it that a molecule can land on. That molecule could be glucose, it could be an amino acid, it could be any number of things here. When it lands on that, on that receptor site, the whole protein changes its shape, closes its, the opening to the outside of the cell and opens the opening to the inside of the cell. It's, a free, it's still passive, it's still a free ride, but it, facilitates certain ions and molecules. And the, these um, carrier proteins 
are usually ion or molecule specific, like the, the carrier protein for glucose isn't going to let potassium in. And the carrier protein for sodium isn't going to let, uh, may let glucose come in with it, but it certainly won't let potassium come in. So there, these, these carrier proteins are very, very specific. And so these carriers, this is what we call carrier mediated facilitated diffusion, mouthful of words. Um, this facilitated diffusion, to facilitate means to help. And we have to depend on the help of these specialized proteins to get substances across the membrane that can't fit through the, the phospholipid layer. They are too big. They are uh, too large. They are not uh, fat soluble. And so they have a real problem getting across here. That makes it very difficult for them. But these carrier proteins facilitate the entry. Okay, now let's move on. Now, if you're a channel protein, there's nothing special about you. You're a tube. Um, you're, you're simply a transmembrane protein that goes from one side to the other across the, the, the cell membrane, and that's it. It's a hole, it's a tube, it's a pipe. Nothing special about it, no, no chain, shape changing or anything. You see the, the structure here in the bottom uh, of the animation is a uh, channel protein for potassium. You can see potassium slides back and forth across here with no problems. But we also see that larger ions and different ions and larger molecules can't get through. Now, this other type of protein, this other type of channel here is a, or carrier, this is a carrier protein up here and it will change its shape to allow a substance to pass through. In this case, glucose can't get through on the, um, glucose can't get through on the uh, channel but it can get through on the carrier. Potassium, potassium can come through the channel, but it can't get through the carrier. So we're very, very selective as to what goes where. See, glucose doesn't get in on the channel, but it can go through the carrier protein. Potassium can't go through the carrier, but it can get through the channel. So all that means is that these proteins dictate what's gonna go across the barrier. And if you are a carrier protein or a channel protein, you're, you come in two categories. You're either going to be a leakage channel, which is always open, like the uh, potassium channel or like the aquaporin, or you're going to be a gated channel and you're going to have gates. You're going to have a gate that opens and shuts. And the gates can be a chemical gate that depend on a certain chemical to land on them to open it up, or they're going to be electrical, which requires energy. Now, everything up to this point and what we're going to continue talking about is passive, no energy involved. But there is, there are times when we want to get substances across the membrane, and that requires active transport. We prefer passive transport. We like things that don't cost anything. We don't, we don't like to pay to spend money to do things. If we can avoid it, we like things free and cells are no different. Cells like passive processes. You know, diffusion and facilitated diffusion are passive processes and we like that. Osmosis is a passive process. Osmosis is the movement of water. It's the movement of water across a membrane from high water to low water. That's what osmosis is. It is a movement of water across the membrane from high water to low water, osmosis. High water to low water. And what does this mean? What is high water? Well, let's say you have a solution here 
in a beaker. It's a big beaker. You have a solution inside this beaker that is 10% sodium chloride and 90% water. That's the water concentration in that solution. It's a 10% salt solution. 10% salt solution is 90% water. If we made that a Let's say that we made uh, let's say we instead of 10% and 90%, suppose suppose we had a pen that would work. There we go. So let's make another. Come on. There we go. Okay, there's our beaker. It's a smaller beaker this time. Instead of 10% and 90%, let's say we had 40% salt. Now, 40% salt means that it's 60% water. Because it always has to total to 100%. So it doesn't matter, you know, as, as long as you know the percentage of the, of the of the solute, you know, 40% salt, 40% glucose, 10% glucose, 20% glucose, 5% salt. It doesn't, whatever the salt, whatever the solute is, subtract that from 100, that'll tell you the water percentage. So if it's 40% salt, it's 60% water because it still has to tally to 100. So you have a beaker with 40% salt, 60% water. Over here is another beaker that is 10% salt. And which means that this has got to be 90% water because 100 minus 10 is 90. So now you have two different solutions. One with the 60% water, one is 90% water. Osmosis is movement of water from high water to low water. When you compare these two solutions, when you compare those two solutions, which one has the highest water concentration? The 40% sodium chloride, which is 60% water, or the 10% sodium chloride, which is 90% water. Well, the high water is found here. 90% is greater than 60%. So this means this is the low water. So if we take these same concentrations now and we put them in a, created an environment where we have a, an, a, a membrane. I've been marked it. Okay. So now we're going to have a, here's an artificial membrane right here. That's a membrane. And over here on one side of the membrane is 10, is 40% sodium chloride and 60% water. The other side of the membrane is 10% sodium chloride and 90% water. Which way is the water going to go? Remember, we said the water goes from high water to low water. Which side of, of this membrane is going to have the high water side? The 90% or the 60%? Well, obviously, it's going to be the 90% side. So this is the high water side which makes this the low water side. Osmosis will drive water from the high water side to the low water side to reach equilibrium. And water will continue to move until it is evenly distributed here. So the example, of course, here 
is if you have a 10% salt solution, you have it's 90% water. If you have a 40% salt solution, it's only 60% water. And water will move from high water to low water. If you have a barrier, water will move across that barrier from the high water side to the low water side. It will find a way to go across the barrier using its aquaporins. So you have a, if you have a, let's give me a, here we go. Okay, if you have a cell, here's a living cell, we'll call it LC, living cell, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, which makes it 99, which makes it 99.1% water. Well, outside the cell, in the interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid, FL, I learn how to spell, it should have the same salt concentration, 0.9% NaCl, 99.1% water. Living cells have the same salt concentration and the same water concentration on their inside as the interstitial fluid does on their outside. So if there's any movement of water, it's going to be equal both ways. Whatever leaves the cell will come into the cell. Now where we get in trouble is if our water concentration changes on one side of the membrane of a cell or another. So for example, If we have our living cell right here, if we have our living cell right here, you know, it's a, well, it's a nice uh, columnar cell. Okay, there's our living cell. If our salt concentration goes up, if we are normally 0.9% sodium chloride, but let's say it goes up to where it's 1%, 1.0% sodium chloride. Out here, it's still 0.9% inside the cell. This side has the higher water to this, because this is 99% water. This is 99.1% water. Water leaves the cell. If the outside of our, if the interstitial fluid becomes too salty, the cells give up water. If the outside, if the interstitial fluid becomes too dilute, water goes into the cells and bad things happen either way. If we have water going into the cells, the cells will rupture. If we have water leaving the cells, they're going to shrink. Now, let's see if I get this thing to work for us here. Let's try and get this video to work. Membrane, both to water molecules, and the movement of water into and out of cells. Is... There we go. The plasma membrane is permeable to water molecules, and the movement of water into and out of cells is critical to life. Diffusion of water molecules across a selectively permeable membrane is a special kind of passive transport called osmosis. Plant cells are surrounded by rigid cell walls. When plant cells are exposed to hypotonic environments, water rushes into the cell and the cell swells, but is kept from breaking by the rigid wall layer. The pressure of the cell pushing against the wall makes the cell turgid and is the desired state for most plant tissues. For instance, placing a wilted celery stalk or lettuce leaf in a hypotonic environment of pure water will often revive the leaf by inducing turgor in the plant cells. Animal cells lack rigid cell walls. When they are exposed to hypotonic environments, water rushes into the cell and the cell swells. Eventually, if water is not removed from the cell, the pressure will exceed the tensile strength of the cell and it will burst open or lies. Many single-celled protists living in freshwater environments have contractile vacuoles 
to pump water back out of the cell in order to maintain osmotic equilibrium and avoid lysis. Plant cells are surrounded by rigid cell walls. When plant cells are exposed to hypertonic environments, water rushes out of the cell and the cell shrinks away from the rigid wall. These cells are dehydrated and lose most or all physiological function while in the shriveled state. If cells are returned to isotonic or hypotonic environments, water re-enters the cell and normal functioning may be restored. Animal cells lack rigid cell walls. When they are exposed to hypertonic environments, water rushes out of the cell and the cell shrinks. The resulting cells are dehydrated and lose most or all physiological functions while in the shriveled state. If the cells are returned to isotonic or hypotonic environments, water re-enters the cell and normal functioning may be restored. Now think about this for a second. When we become dehydrated, we lose water from our plasma. Well, you know, because everything we eat and drink ends up in our plasma. We lose water from our plasma. We lose water from our interstitial fluid. We don't lose the salt. The water, the water around the outside of the cells becomes saltier when we're be when we become dehydrated. We haven't had a lot to drink and we've sweated profusely and we're you know, really thirsty, we've lost a lot of water, the salt levels stay constant, except when we lose water, the concentration essentially goes up. There's less water. We have the same amount of salt, but we have less water. I mean, consider the example I've used before. You have a beaker uh, with one liter of water in it and 100 grams of salt. Okay, you set it aside. And after a week or so, you now have 500 mils of water because the water evaporated. You still have 100 grams of salt. Now, when you mix that thing up, initially it was a 10% salt solution, 100 grams and a liter of water. But after five days, you only have a half a liter of water and still have 100 grams of salt. That means that your salt concentration is no longer 10%, it's 20%. You didn't add anything, any salt to it. You didn't, all you did was let the water leave. In our bodies, if we lose water, we don't lose salt and the salt levels outside our cells start to climb since we don't have as much water there. In response to that, the cells are going to try and reach, uh, reestablish equilibrium and start pumping water out through those aquaporins. The cell is gonna shrivel up and if we lose enough water from the cells, they're gonna stop functioning and we're gonna be dead in three days if we don't have any water coming in. On the other hand, if we try to overhydrate ourselves and you know, that happens you know, uh, occasionally, uh, if we try to overhydrate ourselves, then we dilute the salt water in the, in the interstitial fluid around the cells. We still have the same amount of salt there, but now we've added a lot more water to it. Let's say that a person has consumed large quantities of bottled water. You know, they're, they're drinking one bottle after another. They're really thirsty. They dilute that, that interstitial fluid. The salt concentration drops simply because there's more water there now. <clears throat> and now the outside of the cell has more water than the inside and water rushes into the cell and the cells can explode and they can pop and they pop very quickly. Um, you can see that under the microscope if we have red blood cells and add a drop of distilled water to it, suddenly all you have left is a smear because water goes into those, those cells so rapidly. There's no time for it to adjust, it just, it pops. And all you see is a red smear. And so, our other cells, you know, particularly brain cells are gonna swell. We don't like that either. Uh, <clears throat> the cells can rupture if they absorb too much water. Simply, and it's all driven by the fact that the salt levels, the, the volume of salt stays constant, but its percentage is gonna change as we take water away or add more water to it. We don't like to have these, these fluctuations in here. Anyway. So here's what happens for a red blood cell, for example. 
a red blood cell in salt in water that's saltier than it's used to, because plasma is about 0.9% sodium chloride. Red blood cells in plasma greater than 0.9% are going to crenate. They're going to shrivel. Uh, that's a, a anything greater than than uh, the normal concentration of salt is what we call a hypertonic solution. It's excessively high. You know, we're dealing with a term called tonicity here. The presence of the solute particles, a hypertonic solution causes human cells to shrivel because they're sending all their water out to try and reach equilibrium again. Cells like to be in an isotonic solution. When we give an IV to someone, the IV concentration is 0.9%. So that's equivalent to you know, what our plasma is. That's normal saline. We don't deal with, uh, we don't, you know, we like normal saline. It is, it is the same salt concentration as our plasma is, and we don't have any issues. And this is why we never, ever give distilled water to a patient because a distilled water solution is hypotonic. There are more, that means there's more water outside than there is inside and water's gonna rush in and the cells are gonna lice. And so you would never ad administer distilled water to a patient. You would always use salt water, you know, 0.9% sodium chloride. The, the, the key terms here are isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Isotonic solutions, the osmotic concentration is exactly the same inside the cell and outside the cell. The solute concentration is the same. If it's 10, if it's 0.9% salt inside, it's 0.9% outside. Hypertonic solutions have a greater salt concentration outside. If you were to put a red blood cell in a 10% salt solution, the red blood cell would crenate. It would shrivel up as all of its water is leaving because it's still trying to reach equilibrium. And a hypotonic solution is going to have be more dilute than, than the cell. You know, if normal, normal saline values are 0.9% sodium chloride, then perhaps what you're going to have uh, outside the cell that you've diluted is 0.8 or 0.7 or 0.6 sodium percent sodium chloride. So you're going to have a higher water concentration outside the cell, and water will go into the cells. The cells will, will swell up, and they'll likely burst, and then we call it lysing or rupturing. So, and again, this is what we have to be very careful with, with intravenous solutions. We've all probably had an IV in us at one time or another. Uh, if nothing else, normal saline's coming in just to keep the line open. And then other drugs and medications are administered through that. Um, we use isotonic solutions all the time as fluid expanders to increase the fluid volume if, we, if our patients lost blood. We at least replace the volume if we don't have enough blood on hand. We, you may administer hypertonic solutions to a patient when they have too much edema, too much water in their cells, and they need to pull that water out of the cells. And that can occur in some very serious conditions like congestive heart failure. But you would never, ever administer pure water, distilled water to your patient, because that would cause uh, the cells to rupture. Okay. Now, this is all passive. Let's talk about active transport. Active transport, the cell has to work hard to get substances into it that it wants, or to get substances out of it that it wants to get rid of. And active transport requires energy. Active transport requires energy. About 40% of a cell's energy budget is going to be spent in active transport. It's going to use 40% of its available ATP simply pumping stuff across a membrane. And they're usually pumping against their concentration gradient. They're usually pumping from low concentration to high concentration, like they're pumping uphill. 
from low concentration to high concentration, or whatever they're trying to get into the cell or out of the cell is too big to move through a regular channel uh, or into something that is not lipid soluble whatsoever. So with active transport, we're either gonna use the, a pump to pump the substance across the membrane one way or another, or we're gonna use bubbles known as vesicles to surround the material and, the, and to shoot it out through the membrane. Both of these require energy. Both of these are active processes. Active transport uses a pump. We call it the solute pump. And the most well-known pump is called the sodium potassium pump because it's pumping sodium and potassium across the membrane. It's pumping sodiums out of the cell and potassiums into the cell against their concentration gradients. We can also piggyback certain large molecules like glucose into the cell at the same time or out of the cell. The movement though, against a concentration gradient requires the use of ATP. So active transport comes in two forms. We have what's known as primary active transport and secondary active transport. Secondary active transport doesn't use up, takes advantage of the energy that was spent earlier on active transport. It's indirect energy. It allows us to re-enter the cell after we've been pumped out. We can come in passively after we've been pumped out. Now the energy for active transport is always coming from ATP. Active, make a note to yourself, active transport requires ATP. It requires energy. It's the only way it's gonna work. And the most well-known pump is the sodium potassium pump embedded in the cell membrane. The sodium potassium pump is what's known as an antiport because it's pumping one ion out and bringing another ion in. Our cells are constantly leaking potassium out. We have lots of potassium inside our cells and lots of sodium outside the cells. Potassium is constantly leaking out. We don't want that. We want to get our potassium back in. And we don't like sodium coming in. So we're always pumping it out. So the sodium potassium pump is going to pump sodiums out of the cell and potassiums back in. And we have to have this going on. See, our cells have a charge. Muscle cells have a charge of minus 90 millivolts, and the charge is established by the concentration of sodiums outside the cell and potassiums inside the cell. The, the, con the concentration difference between sodium outside and potassium inside gives us a charge on the membrane of a muscle cell of minus 90 millivolts. If all the sodiums were to leak into the cell and all the potassiums were to leak out of the cell, we'd lose that charge and that cell couldn't do any work for us. The cell wouldn't be alive. It would have given up its electrical charge and it would be done. So we, we can't allow that to happen. We always have to keep, try and keep the concentration difference going on here. Muscle cells and nerve cells depend on the difference in concentration between sodiums and potassiums which is why we spend all that energy as a cell to pump these ions out of the cell and pump other ones in. So this is a sodium potassium pump. It always sends three sodiums out followed by two potassiums in. You need to remember that. Let me go ahead and highlight that for you. It's always gonna be three sodiums out and two potassiums in. This is the sodium potassium pump in the membrane. Three sodiums out and two potassiums back in. 
And you can see there go the there go the three sodiums going out. You can see where the ATP came in, and then that allows us to to grab two potassiums on the outside and bring them back in. Three sodiums out with energy. There they go. Pump changes its shape. It releases the sodiums to the outside. It changes its shape to allow potassiums to be captured and they're brought back inside the cell. We've got to keep the concentration differences between sodium and potassium. So we're always pumping the sodium out and potassium in. But because we have high sodium on the outside, sodium is always leaking into the cell. And because we have high potassium on the inside, it's always leaking out. We use these pumps to work against this constant leakage. They leak, they leak, they leak, and we're pumping and we're pumping and we're pumping so we don't lose the concentration difference. Otherwise, the cell can't do its job. The cell is going to be essentially dead. Okay. So primary active transport over here in the left-hand side. Sodium potassium pump. Sodiums go out, potassiums come in. Secondary active transport occurs after, for example, after we pump the sodium out, it's going to leak back in again. That's what it does. It leaks back into the cell because you're going to have a high concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell, higher than what's on the inside. It's going to leak in. It's going to find a way to get in. And it will leak in through a carrier protein called a symport. Sodium leaks in through this symport. And when it does, it lets glucose piggyback with it. As you can see with the secondary active transport, sodium lands here and causes at, at this particular site on the SIM port. And when it does, it opens up the site for glucose. So sodium and glucose come in back into the cell through secondary active transport. The more sodium you pump out, the more sodium is going to leak back in. And when it leak, leaks back in, it may be dragging glucose with it. And so we get glucose into our cells. You know, it's sort of become, you know, maybe, maybe this is the carrier protein that insulin builds for us or tells the cell to build. But this is the sodium glucose symport that gets that will bring glucose into the inside the cell. So this is secondary active transport. We're going back into the cell. Okay. Now that is active transport using these pumps. The sodium potassium pump, we know more about that than any other pump. Uh, somebody had to study it. But another way we get stuff into and out of the cell is the use of these bubbles called vesicles. And a vesicle is just a large bubble made up of a phospholipid layer, which looks a lot like the cell membrane. And it moves across, since it's made up of the same cell membrane material, it can release sub substances to the outside of the cell without, you know, without any issue with the membrane. We've got three different, we've got two different ways of getting stuff into or out of the cell. It's either endocytosis, entrance, think endo. How do we get stuff in? Well, we can bring stuff in through what's known as phagocytosis, where we're eating things, pinocytosis, where we're drinking things, and what's called receptor-mediated endocytosis, where substances, molecules will land on certain sites and be grabbed. And of course, exocytosis is how we get things out of the cell. We exo exit, we release to the outside. So here in the bottom for exocytosis, here comes a vesicle. The vesicle is made up of the same material as the cell membrane. It fuses with the cell membrane and the substances that were inside the vesicle you know, the substances that are inside the vesicle here, when this fuses with the cell membrane, the substances get released to the outside. 
so we don't have to, you know, we, we never punch a hole in the membrane, you know, so when it fuses, you know, the inside of the cell is never exposed, but the contents of that vesicle is, our vesicle is released to the outside. Now, on top, what you see there are bacteria being engulfed by white cells. This is a type of phagocytosis. Phagocytosis means cell eating. Pinocytosis means cell drinking. So we see a bacteria being eaten by a white cell. You know, we surround it, we surround the bacteria, we engulf it and put it inside its own vesicle and then we digest it inside the cell. Requires energy, but it's a great way of getting large substances into the cell or getting large molecules outside of the cell here through exocytosis. Now, endocytosis, so, you know, we saw the cell eating with the, with the white cells eating the bacteria. What will generally happen in endocytosis is the cell membrane will actually form a vesicle around a substance, you know, like an amoeba does. It comes, oozes up around something it wants to eat and forms a complete bubble around it and it brings it inside the cell proper. And you know, we see here's a particle of food up here where it says large particle. And this is a vesicle here and the membrane changes its shape and oozes around this particle and surrounds it and essentially traps it inside its own vesicle and we bring it into the cell and then we destroy it there. The same thing can be done with some sort of liquid on the outside. Here we have some sort of, some sort of fluid that we want to engulf. So we do the same thing. We form a bubble around it. And over here, we have a special receptor site for some particular type of molecule and only that molecule can land there and we can grab it and bring it into the cell. It's very, very selective. So. And what do we use exocytosis for? Well, our cells are busy making proteins. We make millions of proteins per second and we have to get rid of them. We have to get them outside the cell. And so when those proteins are made, they're put into a vesicle. All the same, all the proteins of the same type end up in, in a particular vesicle. And that vesicle makes its way to the cell membrane and it fuses with the cell membrane and the contents get released. And so we release these proteins, maybe it's a hormone, and we release these proteins out into the interstitial fluid, and then it ends up in our plasma and gets circulated throughout the body. And here's what it looks like. Here is a vesicle magnified 100,000 times, releasing something, maybe proteins, into the fluid, into the interstitial fluid around the cell. Now, the vesicle is made up of the same material as the cell membrane. And so when you see what you see right here is that as the vesicle opens up, our cell membrane is intact. We've never exposed the inside of the cell to the outside environment. All we do is open up the vesicle after we fuse with the membrane. And so our cell membrane has a dimple at that spot. And we just release our, release our material out into the uh, interstitial fluid, as I say, the extracellular fluid, where it eventually ends up in our plasma. Okay, moving on. Now we can actually talk about what is about the contents of the cell and the things that are going on in the cell. The cytoplasm, inside the cell membrane, we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the cell sap. The, the goop, if you will, the cytosol. It is uh, salt water, it's proteins, it's uh, ions. It uh, may be gelatinous, it may be totally fluid. Um, it has all sorts of substances in there. It has little organelles. Uh, 
little subcellular structures that do things for us um, that can release energy from glucose or can make assemble proteins for us or release proteins or go out and destroy pathogens, things like this. So if you are an organelle within the cell, you are either gonna have a membrane around you like the nucleus, the nucleus is the largest organelle or the mitochondria or a structure known as the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a big series of tubes that surround the nucleus. The Golgi apparatus, which sorts out all the proteins that get made. Uh, peroxisomes, which help to break down um, hydrogen peroxide, which gets formed. And lysosomes, which are gonna destroy all foreign substances that it recognizes. These are all going to have membranes around them. They're all going to, they're all going to show up in a structure. The membrane is very, very, very similar to the, the cell membrane of the cell. The non-membranous section, where you don't have a membrane, are things known as the ribosomes, which is where we actually put proteins together, the cytoskeleton, this, this is the cytoskeleton, gives the cell its shape and structure. The centrioles are little barrel-shaped stru structures within the cytoplasm where we originate our spindle fibers during mitosis. Okay, so now this is the mitochondria. Most textbooks call them the power plant of the cell. And I really don't like that phrase. I don't know why it just bothers me. But this definition here is, is somewhat better. Energy conversion factories or energy conversion plants uh, or energy conversion structures. So all they're doing is taking the energy, the potential energy in a glucose molecule, a molecule of sugar, and releasing that energy by breaking down the glucose, by oxidizing the sugar and taking that energy and capturing some of it in ATP. So it's an energy conversion center. You're taking potential energy from sugar and you are burning it and then capturing some of that again as potential energy in the ATP. The mitochondria is a double layered uh, organelle. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. It has a uh, uh, center structure called the cristae. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about that when we get into metabolism. But the, the conversion of glucose from potential energy to kinetic energy and back to potential energy takes place right inside the mitochondria. So now the ribosomes, little structures here, little tiny structures, they don't have a membrane. They don't need it. The mitochondria uh, are the site where proteins get assembled. Mitochondria, I'm sorry, ribosomes are either free floating structures or bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. And when instructions come from the nucleus, uh, on RNA to go make protein, the instructions go out to the ribosomes and the ribosomes will start assembling a protein. It doesn't matter what the protein is, when the instructions get to any particular ribosome, they will get to work and make the protein. And as soon as they're done, they'll start making something else. They're not specialized in that. They look just, they're just protein makers. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum, arguably the largest organelle inside the cell because it's a series of tubes, flattened tubes that surround the nucleus on all sides. You know, this, this example here, you get the impression that it sort of you know, only surrounds it on one side or whatever, but it's actually like a ball of tubes, flattened tubes that completely surround the nucleus. 
and they are continuous with the nucleus. The, what that means is that openings to the nucleus, openings in the nucleus connect directly to the ER, uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum. So what we see is, um, the um, this opening here and this opening here and this opening here, there are structures in the cell membrane, I mean in the nuclear membrane called the nuclear pore. And the nuclear pore is continuous with it, nuclear pore is a hole in the membrane of the nucleus. And it's continuous with these um, openings in, into the endoplasmic reticulum. So when material leaves the nucleus, it goes out the nuclear pore right into the, e the ER, the rough ER or the smooth ER. So instructions on how to make a protein leave the nucleus and go straight to what we call the rough ER. We call it rough because it's studded with ribosomes. What we see over here, where there are no ribosomes, no, ribosomes here, this is what's known as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This is rough because of all the ribosomes here studying on the surface. Messenger RNA, mRNA is put together inside the nucleus with the instructions for a protein and it passes through one of these openings and it finds a ribosome out here and goes to work making a protein. Okay, rough ER and smooth ER. These tubes that surround the nucleus of the cell, these big sacs, these flattened tubules in here, they completely surround the nucleus. Some, you know, some of these tubes are smooth. That's what we call the smooth ER. Most of them are studded with ribosomes. That's where we're going to make proteins from, uh, at. Okay, now, rough ER. Protein synthesis takes place in the rough ER. We make all of our proteins there, or most of our proteins, and most of our phospholipids. The instructions come out of the nucleus. Uh, on the messenger RNA, a, a copy, messenger RNA makes a copy of the instructions off of the DNA, goes out to the ribosome, and goes to work. Now, the smooth ER is totally different. The smooth ER is continuous with the rough ER, so the connections on the rough ER, uh, the rough and the plastic reticulum with its ribosomes has openings directly into the smooth ER. What happens in the smooth ER? We make fats. We assemble fats in the smooth ER. We assemble cholesterol. We assemble um, steroid-based hormones in here. We make hormones like the hormones that are in the, the, that the adrenal cortex makes. Uh, or the sex hormones are made in the smooth ER of uh, the sex cells. We transport fats. We absorb fats in the smooth ER. We use the smooth ER as a detoxifier. No more than that in a second. We, this is also where we take glycogen and break it down to glucose in, in cells, and we store lots of calcium. Now, I'll start from the bottom and work up because this, this, is, this is, some of this stuff is important. All of our skeletal muscle cells are surrounded by a series of tubes known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum, first cousin of the endoplasmic reticulum. You know, sarco means bone. Uh, and no, I was, uh, Sorry, sarco means muscle. I got my Latin mixed up here. Sarco means muscle. And the 
sarcoplasmic reticulum are just a series of tubes that surround structures in muscle cells, and they are packed full of calcium because we need calcium for muscle contractions. So we have lots of calcium stored around every one of our skeletal muscles. When we, get, when we need energy for muscle contractions, we can break down glycogen to glucose. All of our skeletal muscle cells have glycogen packed all around them. So all of our muscle cells have lots of glycogen stored in there so that we can draw on that glycogen to make glucose. Now here's the big one, detoxification of certain chemicals. Now our liver contains many, many cells that are chock full, uh, I guess that's uh, the right term, of this smooth endoplasmic reticulum because liver is the big detoxifier. The liver cleans up everything we eat and everything we drink. Because once we eat something and, and drink something, it goes into our small intestine, is absorbed in our small intestine and immediately transported straight to our liver for cleaning up before it goes back into our blood supply. So all the food additives, all the chemicals, all the preservatives, all the flavorings, um, all the stabilizers, everything that's in the food that, that we eat and drink is cleaned up and broken apart by the liver. And that's what the um, smooth ER does. It tears apart chemicals that we don't need. Consider this, consider the adult dose of Tylenol. Now, if you take Tylenol, Tylenol, the adult dose, is two 500 milligram tablets, 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol. Your liver will attack that Tylenol and try to destroy it because it's a foreign chemical. Now, whatever percent of that Tylenol that survives the liver is what we're gonna use on our, in our bodies. And the dosages that we take are based on the ability of our liver to destroy a certain portion of the Tylenol and have another portion available for us to use. We certainly don't get the full thousand milligrams because our, our, our bodies couldn't handle the thousand milligram. The liver can detoxify a portion of it and then the rest is, is, is given for us to use. Now, and our, the adult dose is different than, than a children's dose. You would not give a, you know, the children's dose is like 200 milligrams of Tylenol or 400 milligrams of Tylenol or whatever, you know, whatever you give a kid. Um, I can't, it's been quite a long, you know, it's been 25 years since I had to dose my child uh, with, uh, no, no, 20 years. So for the children's dose, what, whatever. You wouldn't give a, a, a five-year-old a thousand milligrams of Tylenol unless maybe you didn't like them or something. A, thousand a five year old liver can't handle a thousand milligrams. The reason that dosages change as we get older is because our liver gets bigger and gets more efficient at cleaning things up. You know, an 85 year old liver is likely gonna have problems also dealing with a thousand milligrams of Tylenol. Dosages of medications are based on the ability of it of what the liver is going to detoxify. It also breaks down any kind of food additive. It breaks down all sorts of material. The liver breaks down alcohol. The liver, well, first of all, a toxicologist will tell you that every ingredient is a poison. And because what a tox toxicologist will tell you that the dose makes the poison. So enough water will kill you, enough oxygen will kill you, enough salt will kill you. It may take a lot, but it will kill you. Uh, and in that stead, alcohol is, is a poison. And so our liver will break, can, our liver can successfully break down one ounce of alcohol every hour. It does a very good job in breaking down 
detoxifying one ounce of alcohol every hour. And so if you are at a, a social gathering of some sort and you are indulging in alcoholic beverages, um, which is perfectly fine, um, but if you, and if you maintain one drink, one bottle of beer, one glass of wine per hour, because all three of those are going to have about an ounce of alcohol in there, you're going to end up at the end of the evening, six hours later, maybe eight hours later, it depends on how long your gathering goes. Uh, if you maintain one ounce per hour, you will have no ill effects because your liver will have detoxified everything and broken it down. And other than the fact that you'll have to pee frequently, you aren't going to have any issues. However, if you increase the rate past that one out, one drink an hour to two or three, then you're going to have issues because the liver can't keep up with that increased uh, loading of alcohol. And so if you have excessive consumption of alcohol, the next day you're going to end up feeling pretty unhappy. You're going to have a hangover. And the hangover is brought on by the fact that the liver can, can't detoxify the amount of alcohol that it's been given in that time frame, And so you start ending up with these toxic byproducts like formaldehyde, for example, uh, and wood alcohol, things that are normally made, you know, in the breaking apart of ethyl alcohol, the stuff we drink, you end up with certain intermediate chemicals which are, are made and destroyed immediately. So we don't feel the effects if we, you know, stay within that one drink per hour. However, if we pick up the pace, you know, because as they say, if some is good, more is better sometimes. Um, if we pick up the pace, as we're breaking down the alcohol, we're not breaking down the intermediate steps as fast as possible. So the formaldehyde and the wood alcohol, uh, these various toxins, these toxic chemicals start accumulating. And after time, we start feeling worse and worse and worse. We won't feel the effects till the next day, but we will feel bad because of all these poisons, that's what they are, chemical poisons are still in our bodies. And until, they're, until we finish breaking them down, we're going to feel poorly, as they say. Not only that, but alcohol also inhibits our ability to regulate how frequently we have to pee. And so we pee a lot. The more alcohol you drink, the more you're going to have to pee. And when you pee, you become dehydrated. And so now you're going to be, have a hangover and be dehydrated the next day if you overindulged because the liver is doing its job. So uh, this is just one of the consequences of, of our liver cleaning up everything that we eat and drink. So that's where the, the smoothie are. Very important structures. Now, uh, cells that have the most eat smoothie are going to be the liver, going to be uh, the uh, probably some in the small intestine, but primarily the liver, maybe the spleen. Uh, you know, this is what they do. They clean things up for us. They reduce the toxicity of foods that we eat because everything is considered toxic. It, it's all about the dose. So, now, okay, on to cheerier notes here. How about the Golgi apparatus? The Golgi apparatus is sort of like the FedEx or UPS of our cells. So we start making lots of proteins in the rough ER. We assemble them in the ribosomes. We pack them, package them up in the vesicles. We just, whatever's, whatever's being made, we throw into a vesicle and ship it out. And it goes straight to the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi will sort the proteins out by what they are. So they'll put all of protein A in, in a vesicle and all of protein B in a vesicle and protein C in its own vesicle. So they're going to sort things out like FedEx does when they're at their big sorting assemblies. And then they're going to send one vesicle containing all of hemoglobin and one vesicle containing nothing but hair color and one vesicle containing nothing but eye color and one containing an enzyme and another enzyme and another enzyme. And so they, they, so the Golgi apparatus will take the, 
the, the thrown together collection of all these proteins in one vesicle and sort them out. And at the other end of the Golgi, you're going to get um, a vesicle with all one type of protein. So we say Golgi is the traffic director. And we can and what will happen is that we're gonna we're gonna see these proteins are either gonna get released from the cell, kept at the cell membrane, or transferred over to another organelle called the lysosome. The lysosome contains digestive enzymes for breaking down pathogens and breaking down you know, fragments of other cells, or in extreme cases, breaking down our own, our own cell because maybe it's infected with something. So this is what the Golgi apparatus looks like. We bring all of our proteins down from the rough endoplasmic reticulum in a vesicle. It enters the, um, the top end of the Golgi apparatus. And these proteins are sorted through here. These are nothing but flattened sacs again. And at the end of the sac, we have a, new vesicles that are forming that contain all one type of protein. And the three options then are either to release it into the outside of the cell, into the interstitial fluid where it gets transferred. Maybe it's a hormone. Maybe we're releasing it from a, a, a gland and it's a hormone being released. Or we're going to keep it in place on at the surface of the cell. Maybe it's become a carrier protein to let glucose in, or it's going to go to the, to the lysosomes. And this is what it looks like for real. This is magnified 90,000 times. So it is really, it is a whole bunch of, of uh, sacs folded over, and there's a vesicle right there. Yeah. And you know, this, this gives us our three approaches here. <clears throat> and we can release everything through exocytosis, we can incorporate into the cell membrane. Again, maybe it's gonna be a channel protein. Maybe it's gonna be a carrier protein. Who knows what it is? Or we can produce lysosomes, these digestive enzymes that form into these larger lysosome structures here. So we can go out and hunt down and kill things and eat them. So this is what lysosomes do. We'll talk a little more about lysosomes here in a second. Now, peroxisomes, peroxisomes um, are what we use to go after toxic chemicals, other toxic chemicals, not just in the digestive system, but throughout our bodies. They go after what are known as free radicals. A free radical is a molecule that forms and that, <clears throat> that often is a fragment of a larger molecule and usually but not always, but usually has a charge on it that it shouldn't have, <clears throat> like a hydrogen ion with a negative charge. Or you know, a hydrogen ion with a negative charge or a hydroxyl ion with a positive charge or part of a glucose molecule with a charge on it. They're not supposed to have charges. These free radicals have a lot of energy to move through cells and destroy healthy tissue and this healthy material in the cells, healthy tissue in the body. And so we have to destroy these free radicals. The, um, these peroxisomes use two types of enzymes to do this. We use oxidase which oxidase is an enzyme, it has the ASE ending. Oxidase uses oxygen to break down all of these free radicals into hydrogen peroxide. Now, this is not the same hydrogen peroxide we see in the brown bottle at Walgreens and it foams up when you pour it on a cut and you know, when you're a kid and discover, hey, it doesn't hurt, you know, um, and it's fine. But hydrogen peroxide in the concentrations that we produce in our cells are dangerous. So producing hydrogen peroxide is simply the first step of the peroxisome. <clears throat> the peroxisome then uses a second enzyme called catalase, which breaks the hydrogen peroxide down to water. 
H2O2 goes from H2O2 to water and oxygen. And so we break down our toxic substances into water and oxygen. We have to use these two different types, these two different enzymes to do that. But we get rid of the free radicals, which otherwise would be a real health issue for us. And we use them for breaking down fatty acids too. And okay, this is a good place to stop because um, I have more to say than just look at the pretty lysosomes here. Well, they're orange and green, you know, so I don't know if you call them pretty. Anyway, the point is that I don't have enough time to start this. So we'll stop here and pick up with this on um, Wednesday. And lab today uh, will be the axial skeleton. Uh, and as I said, the lab test opened up this morning and it will stay open until Friday night. So let me get out of here. Does anybody have any questions on anything? Okay, if that's the case, then I'm gonna get us out of here and I will see you in lab.